Hello, I'm Ron Hernig and I'm the chair of the Australian Council of Christians and Jews. And it's my pleasure to be the moderator for this conversation and uh, with my colleague, Alex Katz, the chair of the Victorian Council of Christians and Jews. Uh, before I start, I want to thank Alex and Mark for all the work you've put into today's event. I want to acknowledge that we're meeting on First Nations country. I'm currently on the land of the Ghana people who according to um, elder Uncle Lewis O'Brien, were regarded by other nations uh, as diplomats and philosophers. I acknowledge the traditional custodians on all the lands on which we meet. We recognize their content, continued connection to the land and waters of this beautiful place and acknowledge that they never ceded sovereignty. We respect all First Nations elders and ancestors and any First Nations people here today. So today we acknowledge the passing a year ago of a giant of religious and ethical life in this century. Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs used his intellect, his wisdom, his humor, and his extraordinary skills as a communicator to influence the lives of millions, both Jewish and non-Jewish. Through his respectful interaction with people of all faiths and none, he established a rapport with his readers, his colleagues, and his audiences that generated respect for his own Jewish religious tradition, and perhaps as importantly, for religious traditions in the plural as contributors to human wisdom and enlightened understanding. And he did this by acknowledging and embracing the wonder of the scientific and the philosophical and literary and historical and economic understanding of the universe all the while preserving a great knowledge, appreciation and affection for his own religious tradition and its unique and important contribution to a deeper understanding of the universe. He brought that knowledge and his original, original training as a philosopher and economist to the task of providing ethical and moral guidance for us all at a time when ethical and moral understanding seemed to be in short supply. Today, we are honoured by the presence of uh, three speakers. Rabbi Jeremy Lawrence, who will speak for about 20 minutes, and there'll be two 10-minute responses from the Reverend Dr. Colleen O'Reilly, AM, and Evan Thornley will be introduced by my Victorian colleague, Alex Katz. And then I'll facilitate a discussion between our three speakers and perhaps some questions from you through the chat facility. Rabbi Jen Jeremy Lawrence is a senior rabbi of Finchley United Synagogue, Kinloss. He previously served at the Great Synagogue, Sydney and the Auckland Hebrew Congregation. He was a co-founder of the Auckland Interfaith Forum, a participant in the Australian National Dialogue of Christian Jews and Muslims, and also a religious advisor to the Executive Council of Australian Jewry. He has an MA Honours in Jurisprudence from Oxford University and obtained his rabbinical qualification from several yeshivot in Israel. He has a background in both informal and formal education. He was a coordinator of the informal sixth form program at the Jewish Free School in London. And for a while, he was a research assistant to the then chief rabbi, Dr. Jonathan Sachs, who also came out to New Zealand for to honour uh, rabbi lawrence's first first uh, position as a rabbi so he to present his own very personal appreciation of rabbi lord jonathan sachs is rabbi jeremy lawrence good afternoon everybody in melbourne it is a cold and damp morning here in london it is amazing to see some familiar faces on the zoom peter hollingworth former Governor General, Marion Dacey, what a wonderful person. Denise Scher, devoted member, Rabbi Fred Morgan, lovely to see you. And now I've only got a minuted, a minuscule version of everybody's screen, so I can't see uh, who else is here. But it is a huge pleasure to be able to take the opportunity to uh, be with you and to share some reminiscences on the teachings of my late inspiration and teacher, Rabbi, Chief Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs. So, Rabbi Sachs first came to my attention when he became Rabbi of Marble Arch Synagogue, where I had grown up, 
and while I was at university. And during that time, he published, after arranging a couple of seminars, traditional alternatives. It was a very powerful, somewhat academic look at different movements within Orthodox Judaism, which had the opportunity to shape our Jewish world. At the time, I was both a student and a Jewish youth leader, and the opportunity to find authenticity within our tradition that was still relevant and had intellectual integrity was very exciting. And I suppose that has been the foremost guideline in everything that I've gone on to do. Rabbi Sachs, as, uh, as a, an aspirant chief rabbi, um, took a view that it was important to develop and cultivate rabbinic leadership, and uh, with some financial backing was able to set up the Calms Fellowship Program, which led to a number of people who had come from my school and university um, becoming rabbis. Rabbi James Kennard was just a couple of years ahead of me um, in Melbourne, and in fact was one of my other close influences in becoming a rabbi. He took me into Jewish education, and I took him to Australia. I'm not sure if either has forgiven the other. Um, Rabbi Sachs, took an idea that from within Torah Judaism, there's an authentic roadmap to a better world. And one doesn't need to sacrifice either modernity or intellectual integrity to do that. And therefore, when the opportunity to become a rabbi uh, under his tutelage took, uh, came my way, you know, I, I embraced it and went to study in Israel, coming back occasionally uh, to, uh, um, to you know, try out my sermons and techniques and, uh, and, and received guidance from him. I, advice he gave me that has stuck with me for the entirety of my life. Number one, um, he said at the very beginning of my rabbinic career, Jeremy, I suggest you go far away from London so you can make your mistakes elsewhere. Um, and therefore I ended up in New Zealand and came back no further than Sydney, um, spending 18 years overseas, remarkable opportunities to see a breadth of Jewish living that otherwise I wouldn't have been able to, uh, to, to appreciate. I, one of the things that I never managed to fulfill that he said I should do was to publish. And over the last couple of years, the extent of his publications has really uh, amazed everyone, including his family, with his works being translated into so many different languages, um, from his thought pieces into his Jewish writings, as people in the Arab worlds and in Korea and China are keen to embrace what he taught. And I don't think that even his family um, or closest advisors began to understand the impact of his life and teachings as came out a year ago with his passing, um, as many plaudits were shared. He did tell me after he asked me on the way to synagogue one day what, you know, what my sermon was going to be about, he did tell me, Jeremy, unless you can reduce it to two sentences, you don't understand the idea yourself. And therefore, I have tried to reduce all ideas to two sentences. And, and this is amazing because Diane Binstock, um, who is one of the colleagues on, 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 on the London Beth Din and one of Rabbi Sachs's contemporaries, mentioned at his funeral. And I was, you know, because of COVID, there were very few people there. I was one of the people privileged to be able to attend his funeral. Diane Binstock shared the uh, reminiscence that one day as a young rabbi, Rabbi Sachs had gone into a lecture saying, I think I'm going to be as um, confusing and obscure as is physically possible. Um, um, and that in part was because he took refuge in his philosophy and was not originally um, a, 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 uh, a, an easy public speaker. Um, he wanted to lose people in the breadth of his ideas. I, he managed by the end of his life to be able to reduce things into understandable sentences, sound bites, to make Torah and philosophical ideas accessible to everybody. Um, but his desire to do that was imprinted on me as a, as a young rabbinic student. Um, he also told me to end all sermons on an upbeat note rather than 
um, promising doom and uh, devastation. Um, he used to give me a reading list. I, I asked him what to read, um, and he would share with me ideas. And so um, exposure to Jonathan Haidt, to uh, David Brooks, to other um, influential readers, um, 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 Sinak and uh, getting to why, you know, these ideas were very much part of his reading. And as his research assistant on the Reed Lecture Series, I can tell you how quickly he devoured books. I would find books for him in the uh, university library, um, and it would take me longer to find appropriate passages than it would be take him to read the entirety of the book and to find the, uh, either the, the core meaning that he wanted from it. Um, he told me um, about his disdain for the highly politicized rabbinate, and that was based on his own experiences when uh, you know when he came under a lot of trouble, strife for the dignity of difference, which was one of my favorite uh, motivating books, and came out while I was in uh, while, while I just come to um, New Zealand and then Australia. Uh, he shared uh, sharing that wisdom very much influenced me. Um, but his comments on the politicized rabbinate and his uh, uh, troubles and strife within England as a consequence of that, uh, he reflected on the politics of the local Australian rabbinate um, and, found, and found some of the areas there um, troubling um, for, for maintaining credible leadership. Um, I, not, that he, not that he criticized any individual or any policy, um, but, but he, he did criticize the language of debate. And I think the idea of the language of debate is one of the most important ideas that we see in his approach to uh, faith work, interfaith work, and outreach. Um, uh, I was able to phone him when I had trouble coming up with ideas for sermons. I mean, one has absolutely no idea that one was able to get on the phone to the chief rabbi and say, I'm absolutely you know, in logjam with my community. It's the early days in New Zealand rather than Australia, but you know, I'm absolute logjam. What should I talk about? Um, and he would have a conversation with a young rabbi and share ideas that enabled me to get through the high holidays um, um, ex uh, um, ordeal, if I can use that expression. I'm just going to share a picture, which is one of one of the favorites. Um, let's see if I can share this picture. You should all be able to see picture there. Um, uh, one of the most remarkable meetings I had with Rabbi Sachs was uh, when I was driving him around to meet Murray Bashir in uh, Sydney. Um, at Government House and walking through her gardens and seeing the uh, Opera House in the background there. Uh, for an hour and a half, he and she had the most fabulous conversation about ethnic backgrounds, about child psychology, about faith influences. And Rabbi Sachs was there with Elaine and I was a fly of a wall. And if I can borrow the Hamilton expression, I was in the room where it happened while it was happening. Um, after the meeting, where, where it was a, just a joy to sit and listen to the interaction, after the meeting, I took Rabbi Sachs and Elaine back to the hotel before their next engagement. And he and Elaine deconstructed the entirety of the meeting. They went through absolutely everything that had been said. They shared reminiscences of the, the, the words that had been used. And people didn't understand the extent to which Elaine was a, uh, a part of Rabbi Sachs's intellectual life and the extent to which they shared everything. But the ability to savor every moment of an interaction uh, and his profound appreciation for Marie Bashir, which I think everybody who knew her would absolutely endorse, but, but his ability to draw in I, a religious leader who is not able, who is not about the me, but is about the us, who is about uh, able to learn and to appreciate um, every aspect of what she brought to that uh, conversation uh, inspired me. I, I've never been so inspired being a taxi driver in my life um, but on the back of the meeting to see that you know he didn't just move from the meeting into the next didn't crash exhausted um, a, a, from a punishing schedule I, he wanted to savor and appreciate everything that was around and to be able to break it down understand it share it learn from it um, and, and, and I gained a huge amount from that what I discovered at, uh, at the time of the funeral uh, and thereafter, is that everybody had their own personal idea of Rabbi Sachs. Um, you know, my memories, my recollections were mine. 
um, but everybody from the senior Dayanim to the most junior rabbis had experienced him their own way. Um, despite some of the public impressions, we, we, we discovered that he was completely personable. He wasn't somebody for chit chat and small talk. He would go into himself, but he was thoroughly personal, 100% present when he was engaging with you. Um, he was highly spiritual, not just an academic. And that came across in some of his later writings and commentaries. He had a a, a very uh, eclectic love of music. He had a fabulous love of children. And despite the fact that when he was my rabbi in Marble Arch, he was substantially about the academic side of the rabbinate. Um, when you look at his writings and all the instructions that he gave to rabbis, he completely understood that unless you could be a strong pastoral leader, um, you were failing in your ministry. Um, he would phrase it differently, unless you are able to lift people pastorally, um, you know, he would look for the positive in it, and you're missing out on the opportunity to give them uh, an experience of, of God and tradition. So he was able to crystallize ideas. Um, the Politics of Hope was written as a manifesto for Gordon Brown, became prime minister. Um, it was written long before that, when he was a, a, a young and uh, upcoming politician. The Dignity of Difference, a, a message on pluralism, to heal a fractured world, talking about individual and collective mission, not in God's name, reflection on extremism, um, uh, the great partnership, a response to Dawkins, uh, later books, morality, a, re a return to affirmative thinking and we should be looking to what we can create of a positive message in society. I was for a brief period his research assistant on the Reith lecture series as just as he was about to become uh, chief rabbi and just before I went off to Israel to begin my rabbinic studies and just looking through the early chapter of um, the persistence of faith which is his write-up of the Reith lecture series um, there's a lovely line he says where once we were red or blue we have all gone green. It's talking about political uh, perception and where we are in the, uh, in, in, you know, in 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 the planet. Uh, we have all gone green. There is a God-shaped hole, he wrote, in our ozone layer. So if you were to take a look at the urban skyline, our churches and synagogues are dwarfed by our offices. We've made them our cathedrals, and yet our churches, synagogues, and mosques are not empty people come in and people continue to participate. And he saw in that hope that morality and compassion are, despite the strong business world, and this was written in the, uh, this was written in the very late 80s, early 90s, um, morality and compassion are increasingly on our agenda. And this was the message from then that is a constant thread through his writings into today. A, a favorite quotation of his, which is in the Reith Lectures, in his first lecture, was from Rabbi Chaim of Brisk, the uh, founder of the Soloveitchik rabbinic dynasty, who said, the job of a religious leader is to redress the grievances of those who are abandoned and alone, to protect the dignity of the poor, to save the oppressed from the hand of the oppressor. And this theme of morality, and what we do continues into the dignity of difference. And there's a, a lovely passage in that uh, in which he affirmed the value that all faith brought to its adherence. He didn't say one faith was right. He didn't say that when any faiths were particularly wrong. But he talked about each faith having resonance with its own adherence. He says, morality's had a hard time in the past half century. It's come to represent everything we believe ourselves to have been liberated from. Authority, repression, the delay of instant gratification, all that went with the religious puritanical Victorian culture of our grandparents. For the present audience, he's talking about Victorian era, not Victoria, the state. Virtues once thought admirable, modesty, humility, discretion, restraint, are now dusty exhibits in a museum of the cultural curiosities. Words like duty, obligation, judgment, wisdom, either carry a negative charge or no meaning at all. What I have never seen clearly stated, writes Rabbi Sachs, is the simple fact that systems of morality were not always, but sometimes, an attempt to fight despair in the name of hope and recover human dignity by reinstating us as subjects, not objects, the authors of our deeds and of our lives. And we should be subjects, not objects. We should take responsibility. For him, morality, and this comes through in the whole theme of the uh, um, To Heal a Fractured World, we should take responsibility in liberating ourselves 
to find and engender human dignity. What morality restores to an increasingly uncertain world, he writes, is the idea of responsibility. What we do severally and collectively makes a difference, and that, and that the future lies in our hands. Morality belongs no less in the boardroom than in the bedroom, in the marketplace, as much as in the house of prayer. The duality of his thought and his openness comes across particularly in the dignity of difference, of course. And there he quotes one of his own great teachers, Isaiah Berlin, in Two Concepts of Liberty. Um, to realize the relative validity of one's convictions and yet stand for them unflinchingly is what distinguishes a civilized man from a barbarian. To realize the relative validity of one's convictions and yet stand by them. And in this passage, he identifies the tension between the universal and the particular and a sense of perspective. And that comes across in his representation of Jewish thought, particularly where there's the very famous Gomorrah in Sanhedrin that talks about why we give primacy to the words of Hillel and his students over the words of Shammai and his students. I mean, not that one rabbi was greater than the other, but the modus operandi of Bet Hillel was to listen to the other side first and then restate them first in presenting their own opinion. And this readiness to listen and to dignify other opinions rather than be part of a, dare I say, cult cancel culture, um, to be open to the integrity of others' thought was very important to him. Um, um, I, in The Dignity of Difference, he says, e economics had replaced politics, but economics cannot answer who or why. The politics of ideology has been replaced by the politics of identity. Religion can and does answer the who and the why. And within this, he said there needs to be a respectful approach to religious difference. And he says it is a mistaken axiom that those who don't share my faith don't share my humanity. Um, he goes on in many places to reference jo Jonah's ministry to the people of Nineveh, people who ultimately would be responsible for the destruction of the Jewish civilization. Jonah's reticence personally to be a prophet, sharing redemption to the people who would be our adversaries. He says, no, God says you must share the spiritual world. You must offer hope. You must offer redemption. We have a responsibility to face the world as it is now now in order to create the potential for the future rather than to worry about the what haves you what might be in the future and totally ignore the condition of people in the present i think it's a very very beautiful idea and with that rabbi Sachs was very keen to be a part of interfaith dialogue and just share one quick picture here one quick picture here, Marianne, you will recognize yourself standing there. Gosh, didn't we all look a whole lot younger once upon a time? And Rabbi Sachs really relished the opportunity to be part of interfaith dialogue. And wherever I went, he, wherever I was and he came, he would ask me to set up meetings with the faith leaders because those were of absolute critical, inspirational importance to them. And I think one of the things we discovered, um, you know, we, we knew it before he died, but we discovered at the time of his passing, with the uh, obituaries and the comments that came out from faith leaders. Um, he had become an absolute ambassador, not only, for, um, not only for the Jewish faith around the world, he became faith's ambassador, or one of faith's leading ambassadors within the world as a whole. And, uh, you know, from, from within the Jewish world, that is, you know, for, 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 a, for a local boy who had grown up in Finchley and studied philosophy, who had been a little bit quiet and introvert to begin with, what a remarkable achievement that was and had been. Um, sorry, just one second. Um, so uh, I, I mentioned before that he didn't like religious hypocrisy. Um, he said, for Judaism, the search for religious certainty through science or metaphysics is not mer merely fallacious, but ultimately pagan. And faith is its own world. There are, if I can borrow Stephen Jay Gould's expression, non-overlapping magisteria in this. That's my use of the words, not, not, not Rabbi Sachs's. To suppose that God is scientifically provable 
is to identify God with what is observable. And this for Judaism is idolatry. And in his later writings, where he writes much more about spirituality and spoke much more about spirituality, in his comments in the Siddur and the Machsorim, um, and we see him we see his personal relationship with God in a way that wasn't always obvious when he was talking in a more public environment about Holocaust commemoration, Jewish rights, the state of Israel. Um, but the, the personal connection that he had with prayer and his personal dialogue with God is very, very important. And the imagination that you could reduce God and, into something simply observable was something that he, he, he would say was idolatrous. Um, but on religion and interfaith in general, religions work best when they're open and accountable to the world, when they develop into closed, totalizing systems and sectarian modes of community, when they place great weight on the afterlife or divine intervention into history, expecting the end of time in the midst of time, then they can become profoundly dangerous, for there is nothing to check their descent into fantasy, paranoia, and violence. And to heal a fractured world, there was a call to responsibility, the theology of responsibility and the responsible life. And I think that template is one that we find in a lot of his teachings, the idea that there is a general obligation that you can analyze through philosophy, that if you look at texts, source materials, you will find a theology which is able to rephrase that into a personal religious commitment and then the responsible life is taking the theology of responsibility and actually embracing that. And he talked about that in civil society and charity and in philanthropy. He talked about it very much in, um, in terms of, uh, of, of the environmental issues. And I share one more picture, just, you know, R R Rabbi Sachs at his most joyous, and I had the opportunity to be with him and boats on the water, but also, uh, hang on, but also to uh, enjoy some of the very best of Australia. Um, I mean, Rabbi Sachs was somebody with, with a lane that they loved the nature and the opportunity to cuddle up to a koala. And this is possibly my uh, favorite picture of Rabbi Sachs in uh, sort of an intimate moment. The joy as, that, as he stroked that uh, wallaby and it jumped away from him and the opportunity to feed it and just to be a part of nature. Um, he was a man who had huge love for, for God's creation. Um, and and, and often, often, we miss, often we miss that. Um, in, in To Heal a Fractured World, he said that some areas, and this is paraphrasing Lord Acton, some areas lack rules and have only role models. And I found in Rabbi Sachs um, the opportunity to have a teacher who did model values which were of enduring value and inspired me. Um, and the ones that he highlighted in To Heal a Fractured World, and with this I hand over for further discussion, to be gracious, thoughtful, sensitive, attentive, to have integrity, courage, and psychological strength, to be able to respond to a different people in different ways, knowing what each needs to fulfill his or her part in the scheme of things, is to come as close as we can to living in the world as God lives in the world. We have the opportunity, if we model the values of the divinity, to experience the divinity in our lives and bring it into our world. It's been a pleasure to share these ideas. Thank you very much, Rabbi Lawrence. Um, thank you for joining us and waking up early from uh, London. Um, it's now my pleasure to uh, pass on to our other speakers. Um, but I will say that I first encountered uh, Rabbi Sachs when he visited our school when, in, when I was in high school. Um, and I was one of the people that was uh, given the opportunity to take him around the school. So I, I had the, the pleasure of meeting him when I was young as well. But um, I guess that's, that's many of us have similar stories. Um, and, and on that note, I'm actually going to introduce the Reverend Dr. Colleen O'Reilly AM, who's an Anglican priest and chaplain at Trinity College, University of Melbourne. She has spent her ministry in theological education nationally and internationally, and has been a vicar at two Melbourne parishes. Um, in the 1970s, she lived at St. John's Wood near the home of the, de the then chief rabbi, and also had the privilege of meeting Rabbi Sachs when he was in Melbourne, as, as many of us have. 
So I'm going to pass over to Colleen um, to share her reflections and maybe some uh, reflections on what Rabbi Lauren said. Then I'll introduce Evan, who'll do the same, and then Ron will uh, lead a discussion. Uh, thank you, Alex, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, I had the great delight in meeting Rabbi Sachs quite serendipitously. I'm not quite sure yet how it, uh, still how it happened, but he was in Melbourne and uh, I was invited to come to a small gathering to meet him. Now, I, I understood the significance and the importance of the role of Chief Rabbi because 50 years ago I lived in London and I happened to live in Northwest 8, St John's Wood, and I got to know an Orthodox family because I babysat their small children. So I, um, I had heard of the role of, of a Chief Rabbi of the Commonwealth and I understood it to be something akin to the role of Archbishop of Canterbury. So I was delighted uh, to um, be invited to a small gathering to meet Rabbi Sachs. What I was not prepared for was uh, an overwhelming sense of being in the presence of a profoundly charismatic leader, a person um, who I have to say for me just exuded holiness, a depth of holiness, which was not, um, it was just integral to who he was. I, I, it was a, a sense of being in the presence of um, a very special person. And I can't actually remember everything he said that afternoon. He spoke with the group and there was some, some interaction. Um, but I was just um, bowled over by the depth of the person I was meeting, it was one of the, he struck me as an example of um, what we would say in the Christian tradition was grace building on nature, a man who had been profoundly shaped um, through his prayer and reading and uh, study and who um, had um, great depth to offer. And of course, that depth is seen in the scope of his writings. It was only after that that I then became familiar with some of his writings. And, um, and this last week, I've been watching some a few uh, videos. It's a, a wonderful wealth of material of his teaching that's available, not just in books, but, but now on the internet. And um, I must say, it's only one of two times in my life I had a sense of being in the presence of great holiness. The other time was when I met the mothers of uh, two of the disappeared. People might remember those um, mothers whose children were uh, disappeared in Chile and they would um, meet each Friday afternoon and uh, wear white scarves while they gave silent witness to the uh, in injustice that their families were experiencing. And so this was a moment of, I think, being in the presence of great holiness. And a holiness which, you know, it's a kind of unfashionable word, holiness, and, and who wants to be said by others to be a holy person? It sounds, um, it sounds so unappealing in many ways, and yet, of course, it's profoundly appealing. It was most attractive in the sense of, um, as, as many thousands of others have been, to being drawn to the person and to the wisdom and the teaching that the person had to offer. And, of course, that's what I, I gained from my um, brief encounter with Rabbi Sachs. He became, for me, somebody who was... Um, whose writings and teaching opened up for me... Uh, an understanding of the Jewish faith, which of course is, is, is the roots of my own Christian faith. And so I, uh, through my encounters with him in his writings, I find myself able, able better un to understand not just his Judaism, his profoundly human and wonderful Judaism, but also my own Christian faith is illuminated by what he had to write and to say. And he's he seems to me to speak into um, so much of what's what's happening in our world and even in, in my own church at the moment. Um, we're caught up in a lot of um, tension and hostility over human sexuality amongst uh, Anglicans, not just here in Australia, but around the globe. And uh, one of the things that I read that has never left me is that he said that the measure of our righteousness lies in how many people we value, not in how many we condemn. Profound insight into how we can have respectful conversation across great difference um, and uh, yet not um, negate the humanity of other people. 
So my brief encounter with Rabbi Sachs never, has never left me. And uh, I was profoundly sad to hear when he died because he's only, he was only six months older than me. And uh, I certainly don't think of myself as old, though, because I am. But um, it seemed that we, in him we were given one of those great minds, great hearts that God bestows upon the world from time to time at at the time that he was chief rabbi, our own church had Archbishop Rowan Williams, also a great teacher of the faith and a profound human being. And uh, it struck me when I heard of his death that he'd been taken from us too soon. And yet, of course, there's never too soon in the providence of God. But thanks be to God for the great legacy of his writings and, um, as I said, the YouTube videos and uh, um, memories that he he has left so we have much to thank God for when we give, when we think of him thank you very much Colleen for those reflections um, and as I said we'll come back to a discussion um, that Ron will lead in a minute it's now my pleasure to introduce uh, Evan Thornley um, uh, Evan is a conviction convert who converted to Judaism initially in 2013 and then again in 2021, um, at the end of a 40 year journey, which started in 1981. He is the father of three adult children, uh, is married to Stephanie, but she's stuck in LA and I believe she's on the line with us uh, today. Um, he has visited Israel 38 times as a leader of, or member of various trade and political delegations. He first encountered Rabbi Sachs's work reading Radical Then, Radical Now in 2013, and has read his complete works in the period since. He regards Rabbi Sachs as his primary teacher and influencer, and his Jewish name, Lev Yonatan, is a reference to Rabbi Sachs, although Rabbi Sachs's name was not actually Yonatan in Hebrew. Um, uh, in, in the outside world, Evan is a serial entrepreneur and political uh, uh, sorry, activist. He founded Australia's first uh, NASDAQ-listed tech unicorn, Luxmart, and was CEO for the, uh, of, uh, sorry, and was CEO for Australia of the then globally of the then global organization Better Place, an electric car company. He was also at one point um, an MP um, and parliamentary secretary to, Prem to, the, to the Victorian Premier. Um, on that note, let me pass over to Evan, who'll share some reflections of his own about Rabbi Sachs and about his journey to, to Judaism as well, maybe as part of the Rabbi Sachs influence. All right, Alex, thank you very much. And uh, thank you for the opportunity. Um, I, I can't bring the scholarly or indeed the spiritual leadership of uh, the other speakers, so I'll try and bring some personal reflection. Although I must say, this forum is quite um, uh, quite delightful for me because it brings together various parts of my long and strange journey. So uh, lovely to see you here, Archbishop uh, Hollingworth. I was had the privilege of being on the board of the Brotherhood of St. Lawrence for many years uh, and your distinguished service there continued uh, continues to influence. Um, and actually, I, I think I've listened to the Wreath lectures at least a dozen times, cover to cover. Um, so, um, Rabbi Lawrence, it's um, great to see your influence there. I think they're a profound work. Um, uh, and to be in this forum, I guess, just to give you, I've had an interesting professional background in, in high tech business and uh, political activism and social ventures like the uh, the Good Start Consortium. But um, uh, I've had a faith journey too that I actually started with my best friends uh, uh, salvaging me from my difficult childhood by taking me along to their fundamentalist Christian church when I was 11 years old. Um, and, um, and then traveled through uh, a, a, a journey through liberation theology and the radical end of the Catholic Church when I started in university and then through uh, the Brotherhood of St. Lawrence and the Anglican Church. And now I find myself as a twice converted Jew, uh, originally conservative and now Orthodox. So um, I guess it was just time for confession when I start to let you know my various uh, crimes and misdemeanors along the way. Um, I was really honored to be asked to speak on Rabbi Sachs. I'm not the expert, I'm just a big fan. Uh, and as Alex said, uh, that for me started with uh, reading Radical Then, Radical Now, or as it's called in the US, A Letter in the Scroll, which was a funny one for a non-born Jew to read since it was written 
uh, I believe originally as a as a as a letter, literally actually to his, uh, I think, son and daughter-in-law, um, as they approached their their marriage. Um, and but it's led me a lot of times to speak to a lot of audiences, mainly of young Jewish adults, about why they should stay Jewish. Um, and and I guess I do that because most of them either want to be uh, tech entrepreneurs or political activists. And having done both of those things. Um, I can tell them that being Jewish is infinitely more important. Um, and I usually uh, uh, then rely heavily on Rabbi Sachs's teaching. Um, I guess as I was reflecting on what I could usefully contribute today, um, I, I think of Rabbi Sachs intellectually as the great integrator. Uh, and I think that's one of the many, many things that I've appreciated so much in his work. Um, you know, I mean, I, I think the great partnership, you know, religion, science and the search for meaning is just an absolutely magisterial work. Um, but he doesn't limit himself to being able to integrate in a seamless and coherent whole religion and science, a task for which most of the modern West seems incapable. Um, but he equally integrates, you know, his original start in moral philosophy um, uh, a deep understanding of economics, of psychology, of literature, of history, uh, just this incredible breadth of disciplines into a single coherent worldview. And then that worldview is transmitted through all of his writings. I mean, whether I'm reading, um, you know, notes of footnotes of commentary in his Siddur's or um, Matsurim through, through to his very famous published works. And, and, and for me, you know, that, that, is, that, that is a quintessentially Jewish approach uh, or a quintessentially monotheistic approach in the sense that if we believe that Hashem is the single loving creative force within us and between us and in the entirety of the universe, then it ought to all hang together. And, and all streams of human knowledge ought to be able to speak with each other um, and, and, and be able to be integrated into uh, something that makes sense. And, you know, part of Rabbi Sachs's great contribution, I think, was, uh, and, and to your point, Rabbi Lawrence, his, 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 his later skills in, in soundbiteism, um, you know, was around the notion that, you know, science pulls things apart to tell you what they how they work, religion pulls them together to tell you what they mean. And, you know, that simple, simple single sentence description, you, you know, um, belies a depth of integrated thinking that I think is really profound. And, 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 and you know, enables, enabled him and then those of us who've tried to follow him to engage in those debates between secular modernity um, and its radical extremes in terms of militant atheism and what I would call scientism um, in an intelligent and coherent way. And, you know, I think Rabbi Sachs made it clear that many, many of those radical voices make claims for science that science itself has never made. Uh, and so, <laughs> Uh, are seeking to impose upon science um, uh, a, a set of political or theological or atheological views um, uh, that science itself has never uh, has never claimed for itself, nor would it. Um, and and I think he sort of adeptly described that, but did so while referring to science. I mean, his integration of evolutionary biology, of cosmology, of um, you know, a wide range of scientific disciplines into uh, his complete understanding of the world in, in the same way as he integrated, uh, I mean, Sachs's discussion on behavioral economics and game theory uh, and, uh, and how effectively uh, those things have come to bring a, uh, an economic proof to the original doctrines of, around trust and forgiveness. Um, it was, you know, for me, remarkable. Um, his engagement with, uh, 
you know, Piaget through to Carol Dweck through uh, Freud and all of the schools of psychology um, in, in literature from, you know, Shakespeare to Tom Stoppard, uh, his understanding of history. Uh, I've got to admit most of the books behind me here, uh, well, the ones you can see probably half by Robert Sachs, but um, of just political and social commentary came from just following his uh, footnotes to the books he was reading and then following them back and discovered, you know, great secular thinkers um, uh, like um, Christopher Lash or, um, you know, some of the great discussions uh, of, of, uh, of um, uh, religious, uh, well, uh, secular figures who had religious faith, whether that's Alastair McIntyre or or you know, a whole range of, of uh, Gertrude, uh, Gertrude Himmelfarb for that matter. Um, so just the breadth of his knowledge, but his desire, at least it seemed to me, to be able to make it all make sense. Um, and, and, you know, to me, that's, I think, one of the great challenges for all of us is to try and have a coherent worldview at any point in time that is able to explain to ourselves, let alone to others, all of the things we've learned and all of the things that we've experienced. Um, and that in itself would seem to be a logical thing to want to do if our life's mission is really to learn to understand God and the, the, the infinite breadth and reach uh, of God in our world. So for, for me, that just, you know, made him a towering giant of a figure, both intellectually as well as spiritually. Um, and certainly, you know, as somebody who's traversed a journey through a range of both political and religious schools of thought, um, searching constantly for any particular school of thought that had the twin benefits of intellectual coherence and moral clarity, uh, I didn't feel that I really found anything that could satisfy those uh, until I came across my experience of Judaism, but particularly interpreted for me by Rabbi Sachs. So, um, so look, that that's probably the most that I can contribute at this point. But um, uh, his his legacy lives on in a, in in just and will grow in in such a remarkable fashion. And it's really exciting for me uh, to see this type of forum that is um, amongst a range of people of faith. Um, who, who are celebrating the dignity of difference uh, in, in the way that we should. Um, and, and I'm sure Rabbi Sachs would be, um, would be encouraged by seeing that continue. So thank you. Thanks, Evan, for your deeply felt appreciation. And thanks, uh, Jeremy and Colleen, for a, um, highly emotional and personal reactions to to Rabbi Sachs his, as a person and his work. Um, Rabbi Sachs often refers to a special capacity in Judaism to deal with difference. First of all, I suppose um, I should ask Jeremy, is that true? And uh, Colleen, whether from a Christian perspective does that strike you as true and what, what, uh, what does that contribute to an uh, interfaith understanding? And Evan, is that part of the reason that you made the choice to be Jewish? I'm not able to, to, to answer to a, a, a special capacity to address difference. Um, it gives us instruction on difference. And that is particularly found, I talked about Hillel and Shammai before, I, within rabbinic argument, there is a discussion of elu ve elu divrei kim chayim. These and these are the words of the living God. And that doesn't mean that every opinion is the word of the living God. And occasionally, people sort of misrepresent it as that. I mean, there are many things that God says he finds repugnant and inappropriate. Um, so it's 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 not a, a a blank slate. On the other hand, what we do see within Judaism is even as Abraham is guided to prefer Isaac over Ishmael. There is a recognition that Ishmael has a valuable part in the world, even as Jacob um, is preferred over Esau. 
there is Isaac's desire to bless his son and to appreciate the talents within him and rabbinic challenge that Jacob should never have been allowed to get away with separating entirely from Esau. So where, where we're set up with the goody and the baddie in the Torah's basic presentation, rabbinic wisdom has always tried to claw back and love the marginalized part. And so there is a strong and enduring idea that everybody brings something of value to the world. And, and that is found in the ethics of the fathers, where it says that there is no object without its purpose and no person without his or her time. Um, now, I'm not quite sure what the purpose of the coronavirus might be, but the rabbis do argue about the value of the mosquito. Um, and there is a discussion about biodiversity and, and, and the general natural order of things within that. No person without his or her time is, 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 a, is one of the most beautiful ideas that I, that, that, that I share um, when it comes to funerals and other times where we wonder what our life has contributed. And God willed that every person have a moment of existence. I'm not sure whether it's the finest moment they appreciated or some insignificant moment, but every individual has that, and the world would be incomplete without that individual, whoever he or she, who they might be within it. Um, and to that end, our responsibility is to find and draw out and to optimize that individual's value. And that means that every idea has a value, even if the negation of it is the purpose. I mean, every movement has a passion, and that has a value. So Judaism doesn't necessarily dignify every idea or every, um, every movement as right, but it definitely sees that within every individual and within every rational and spiritual advance there is merit to address. Colleen? Uh, yes, thank you. Um, it, well, uh, it's, it's, it's difficult to um, think of a, unify, a, a time when the Christian faith was actually completely unified. Okay. I've often said to people, we wouldn't have so much of Paul's writings, if people had been behaving themselves and totally agreeing, Paul never wrote to any any of the communities that he founded and said, you know, dear Ephesians, you're wonderful people. There's no dissension among you. Love Paul. <laughs> he wrote rather to correct disputes that were happening in the churches at the times, and they were disputes over, um, well, initially, of course, over who was included in in the um, fellowship of the church, and uh, and then over beliefs and. Um, uh, and over, over understanding what Christians were believing God to be doing through Jesus Christ. So, and that continues. I mean, we wouldn't have so many denominations if there weren't so many disputes. And uh, I'm not aware that Jewish people have ever um, uh, had a civil war amongst themselves, but certainly Christians have. And um, Christians have waged wars against others. So, um, there's nothing that protects us from our own propensity to violence uh, in the end, if we're determined on it. And uh, what, what is, a lot of people cannot uh, cope with is genuine difference and learning to live together in difference. We could probably do better, I'm just now speaking about Anglicans, we could probably do better uh, if we didn't have to make so many decisions or, or um, decisions about how to act. The present crisis, for instance, over um, human sexuality, that's the big picture issue that's, that, that is um, causing so much dissension. Human sexuality, how diverse is it? How should it be expressed? Is it possible for a godly sexuality be, to be expressed between people of the same sex? Some, a lot of Christians would say yes and give witness to that in their own lives or in the lives of people they know. Other Christians would say absolutely no way and, and both sides um, will be, get caught up in a struggle as to 
how we are going to act as a church. And until we can um, move to a point where we can allow people to behave differently and to understand that their motivations may well be as good as we believe our own to be, then we'll always have um, that kind of antagonism. And for Anglicans, that often um, comes out most, most completely in our synods, which are like parliaments. We know how dysfunctional parliament can be. And so our synods can be just as dysfunctional. And that's, that's what really gets us into strife. And I think, I think we often in those debates fail to go to that deeper level, which I think um, Jonathan Sachs seems to me in his reading and writing always to try and take things down to a deeper level and to take people to a, um, a better starting point, a more a firmer starting point. And we sometimes forget to do that. We get caught up in the, in the politics of it and the, and the uh, contemporary debates rather than... Um, going back and asking what's really going on here. When we, have, when we are at, at odds with one another over human sexuality, we're really um, arguing over some of the most basic aspects of what it is to be human, but we often don't acknowledge that. If we, it, it becomes a much more superficial debate. So we need to um, go back and ask, what does it mean to be a human being made in the image and likeness of God and to be embodied beings of which sexuality is a dimension. So um, I, I, I don't think we're very good at handling difference. We try to embrace comprehensiveness and Anglicans are probably better than some at, at doing that, but when we're, we're not glowing examples. We may not be good at handling differences within our religious traditions. Um, we may be better at handling differences between our religions yes. and, and, and between faiths across faiths as well yes yeah evan yeah look I, I think one of the many things that i found really um satisfying as i read more of rabbi Sachs in my early jewish journey um uh you know there's a lot in the reflections among others around you know his just beautiful conceptual articulation of universalism versus particularism well, what are the things that should be universally true for all of humanity and what are the things that will be different to different groups and that that's okay and just a very recognition that those two categories of thing exist um, is something that's sadly lost in much modern debate which seems to be universalist in its tendencies uh, and everybody assumes that the rest of humanity should be adopting their own standards. And, and even apparently worthy ideas like human rights, for example, can be interpreted in particular ways and then justify uh, the imposition of a view of the world, a, a universal view of the world onto um, people who don't wish to share that view um, uh, on the basis of a universalist philosophy or ideology. And I think you know, Rabbi Six, Sachs, I think, articulated really clearly the idea that there are some things which are universal, but there are many things which are particular within the group and that we need to have a respect between groups rather than a desire for universalism. And, and you know, that's pretty central to the architecture of faith. Uh, if you believe that there is one God, as Christians, Muslims and Jews all do, and yet we have different faiths, unless we believe that uh, that relationship with God can be manifest in different ways to different groups, um, then if we adopt a universalist view, then that inherently means that we believe everybody else is wrong. And, and the great temptation of universalism is that it leads to tyranny. And uh, whether those universalist ideas are religious ideas or political ideas, anybody, any, any group of people that... Um, seek to impose their views as right for all humanity onto other views, risk going from sharing what might be good about their views to imposing what might be problematic on, on, on an unsuspecting public. And, and, and those who seek the will to power, uh, as Rabbi Sachs often called it out, um, will justify their will to power with some superficial um, uh, attribution to some apparently worthy thing which they're seeking to impose universally. So, 
So I, I just think that, you know, he's not the first and not the last to articulate that conceptual architecture, but he articulated it, I think, incredibly clearly and incredibly powerfully and in a world of faith and in, in interfaith discussion critically. Um, so I just think that's really important. And then similarly, of course, um, talked about it, the difference between arguments for the sake of heaven and arguments for the sake of domination. And I think within our, within our traditions, um, uh, that watchword, of course, is also really valuable that, um, that as we are debating within our tribes, um, what, what, what we stand for, that, that that notion that having those debates for the sake of heaven rather than for the sake of domination is, is the, the standard by which we should judge our own conduct. And sadly, I, I think we all find in many of those internal debates everywhere, we fall short of that standard by a pretty fair margin. But I think Rabbi Sachs was always very clear about that. And I think, you know, lived to that standard in his very public life in very difficult circumstances to a very high degree. I, I, I'm, I'm sure someone would find examples where that may not have been the case, but um, uh, I think he held to the standard of continuing those arguments um, without fear or favour and without backing down or in any way apologising for his faith and his understanding of Judaism, um, but to do so for the sake of heaven. So, so I think those twin contributions are, are towering in their impact and so, valuable uh, to everyone. In what must have been one of his last public appearances, he reflected on political and social divisions in the United States and the UK. And he includes a range of things, the inability of people to talk politics with their relatives or friends because uh, for fear it will lead to them breaking apart or the poisoning of family relationships or the massive threat of economic inequality. Or he talked about loneliness uh, and social life isolation and what's now called cancel culture. And he sees that as all part of an emphasis on the self as opposed to, um, as opposed to the other, uh, a focus on the I at the expense of the we. Do you think that's a useful way to characterize the ethical issues of the time? I think that's absolutely central to what um, he he's I saw his um, mission in in that sense, and uh, I think that's one of the, prop, the one of the major difficulties of our times. One of the major um, malaises of our time, isn't it? I think he I think he called the selfie the sort of the um, the new I've forgotten the words. He, he spoke about the selfie as the new um, new kind of icon of our time, not not his word, but he, that's the the concept I took away from it. That strong emphasis on covenant is is very um, apparent in his writings. That 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 we are bound together with one another, and that we and that uh, the fullness of life consists in living into that covenant, not trying to um, wriggle out of it. And that's of course that's a concept that that's right at the heart of of um, any of this any of the faiths, um, monotheistic faiths. But it's of course key for. Jews and Christians and I think his the way he spoke about our common humanity lived in its diversities really speaks into that place where we've forgotten that we belong together that we're all in this together and that it behoves us to honor the humanity in other people and to um, and to live honoring that humanity Thanks. And Jeremy, what do you think? Well, it's very, very much about interrelationship. Um, I, the, the primacy of the, expel, uh, of the self to the expense of the other is one of those ideas that he sees as totally repugnant. Um, I, it's strongly emphasizing the idea of, of charity um, and charity not as a matter of coming from the heart to see somebody who's suffering and feeling I can be good and I can save them, but as an absolute responsibility. Tzedakah is about righteousness. It is what God wants us to do with our wealth. And we are here in order to interact with others and to help to lift them up. And that is what it is to be a partner of God in creation. Um, I, I think he, he, he saw the, um, the demands for immediacy 
um, sectarian advantage to the expense of the other as, 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 as repugnant problems of our time. Um, and, and, and indeed took it further, you know, while, while, while he would have taken the, uh, I mean, the, the, the religious distinction between humanity and the animal kingdom, but the despoiling of God's world um, and the destruction of biodiversity, you know, th these are things which resonated as, as, as terrible. I mean, the short term advantage of living for the moment, whether it was for an individual or for communities at the expense of others was, was, was exactly what he railed against in many different guises through, his, uh, through the entirety of his literature. Um, Evan, you spoke about um the difference between science as a as, as breaking things apart and religion as putting them together and finding meaning um perhaps you might like to uh expand a bit on that well i'm, I'm going to do the politician thing and answer a question you didn't ask me because i wanted <laughs> to just jump in on the last one if i may um um you know, as I, as I just as because I, I want to reflect on that, as I was talking before about Sachs's capacity to advance universalism and particularism and understand the roles of each. Uh, and I think in particular, most modern discourse seems to um, jump from one to the other without understanding uh, either of them, um, uh, focusing on the rights of particularities, but then on the universal requirements of certain other things without even reflecting on the seeming contradiction between those particularities and, and, and universalities. I think the same is true for Sachs, along with a lot of other sort of centrist and communitarian thinkers, some of which drew from him and some of which from he, which he doubt, no doubt drew. You know, on the one hand, we are a hyper individualistic culture. And I think he was very critical of that in, in the quote you described. On the other hand, we get obsessed with uh, the large group, um, whether that's uh, the nation or the race or the gender or the class or whatever. Um, and, and so much of traditional left-right politics is the battle between, you know, the individual and the state. Uh, and I think what Sachs highlighted as other great thinkers have is there are some intermediate levels in between the individual and the large group that are actually more important than both of them. And that is the notion that we are the sum of the fabric of our intimate relationships, that that our close family, close friendships, close community is actually that which truly defines us. Um, and, and that, and there's any amount of empirical evidence that supports this, you know, from the, uh, you know, the, 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 the study at Harvard over 75 years that, that human flourishing is actually predominantly defined by the quality of one's intimate relationships. And I think Rabbi Sachs intimately understood that and advanced that in, in every, uh, facet of his work uh, as, if you'll forgive me, borrowing a phrase of his, uh, as a sustained critique of the um, dualism of either individualism or large groupism, uh, which seems to dominate most of modern politics and most discourse in the modern West. So, you know, I think that's such a signal contribution that he made and, and continues to make. And, and it's... Um, the diminishment of the importance of our intimate relationships versus either our individualism uh, or uh, the dominance of, of, of group identity at the expense of um, intimate relationships that I think is much of the problem that we have here and I, and, I, and I think would be a fair summary of his critique. I'm wondering if he had a... I'm wondering if he had a somewhat idealised notion of... Um, the family and whether that was a concern Colleen for example how how would how does he speak to you as a woman um yes he may have I think I think um, Evan's uh Evan is correct in saying um that one of his emphasis was our um intimate social network um and and of course, when that is good and healthy, it's glorious. There's nothing better. And, uh, and I'm sure that delights God when marriages are happy and families are, are healthy and, you know, and uh, people flourish. That's wonderful. The problem, of course, comes when, it, when it, it doesn't work like that. And that's difficult. And as I was listening to Evan, I was thinking, uh, what an imperative then that makes it on all of us to... Um, 
uh, try and equalize opportunities because the reality that our personal networks are the, the seedbed of our um, well-being in, uh, in life is makes it very important that we maximize that for everybody. And we, we know now the pandemic has shown us how great the inequalities are in our society and how little opportunity some have and how, and how ill-equipped for the enormous tasks of being a partner and being a parent some people are. And we, we need to, somehow we need to get back in our politics, we need to get back to providing the resources, the support, and um, that, that people need to do those things well. Carlo Sachs was a very staunch defender of the family uh, in, uh, in the House of Lords, as well as his public discourse, um, describing families as the, the crucible of humanity, the miniature world in which we learn to face the wider world. Um, but he, he, was, he was cognizant of the problems within families. And he, you know, he, he writes in Celebrating Life, families are not ideal worlds. They're significant precisely because they are real worlds with people we know and trust working out our tensions with them we learn how to resolve tensions with society they are where we count where we make a difference where we first find that others are there for us and we must be there for them and yes they have their share of pain it is the pain of life lived in relationship without it we couldn't learn to love um and he, 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 he he trenchantly defended the importance of family dynamic um and the relationships based on you know an an, an intention for longevity, security in relationship, the transmission of ideas from one generation to the next. And again, you see these coalesce through the entire corpus of his writing. Um, Evan? Yeah, look, such an important discussion. I mean, I think, uh, I, 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 think I think maybe I'm projecting my own views, but I think Rabbi Sachs was import, highlighting the importance of, of of seeking to build successful families because exactly as Colleen outlines, when when you have dysfunctional families, that 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 can cause just enormous difficulty for people. And as someone who came from a deeply dysfunctional family and having grown up in a sole parent family um, with six sisters and um, and then becoming a single dad myself. Uh, it's a source of constant wonderment to me that the million single parent families in this country receive almost no discussion from anyone, um, while other factors of identity uh, appropriately and necessarily receive uh, a lot of attention. Um, but you can't see that someone's a single parent when they're walking down the street. Um, and so you can't attach that identity to them. And so, and that's the very point about uh, the nature of our of, of the fabric of our intimate relationships is that by definition it's not about us as an individual and it can't be characterized in a way that can be physically seen or identified uh, and yet the artifacts of the success or failure of that intimate environment have profound implications on the life chances of everybody associated and and so I, th I, I, I may be projecting I, I think Rabbi Sachs deeply understood that um, uh, you know, it, it's clear from uh, from his writings, and I'm sure uh, Rabbi Lawrence, knowing him personally well, you know that his own family of origin and his own marriage—I'm sure they weren't perfect—but were clearly sources of enormous strength for him. The way he speaks so beautifully about his relationship with his father, for example, um, and the respect that he had for him um, uh, uh, would have colored his view on those things, but I, I, I'm sure in his role, uh, he's seen more than most the impact of dysfunctional family life and therefore the importance of getting it right and and the stupidity of, um, of polarized debates that are either pro or anti-family, whatever that means, or, you, you, you know, it, we're, we're in favor of good families and against bad families, right? Like it's not too complicated. Um, and. <laughs> And but 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 to ignore the fabric of intimate relationships altogether and pretend that everything that happens to people is either a product of their individual identity or a product of their large group identity, I think is a is a supposition that he would reject wholeheartedly and correctly. 
I can, I can, I can thank you, thank you for that, uh, Evan. I, I can say with confidence, Rabbi Sachs enjoyed the diversity of his own children, um, and the relationships and and directions that that that, that they took. Uh, and uh, you know, on, on you know, referring back to your observation on loneliness and single parent families and and dysfunctionality, uh, you know, the family is the idealized crucible. Um, in Rabbi Sachs's writing, um, but beyond that, there's a there's a wider circle which is community. Uh, he describes community as a society with a human face, the place where we know we are not alone, um, and 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 it is very much this idea of you know responsibility to bring people in. I mean, right at the beginning, God says that it's not good for an individual to be alone, even in even in the Garden of Eden, it's not good to be alone. You know how much more so. When we're in the world of the world of people, um, and where other people have interaction, to be alone in that is particularly lonely. Um, so there's a responsibility to step in. I recall. I was just going to uh, recall him speaking about that uh, wonderful uh, text from Psalm 23. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Now, of course, I hearing that as a Christian, I always we always think, ah, oh, yes, that means God is with us. He he brought out for me uh, in speaking about that that others are with us as well. That we, it's and and uh, thank you to Jeremy for that insight about. It's not good to be on your own, even when God is your only companion. You know, the, and the, I, we are made for one another and and we need one another. And there's nothing, one of the best gifts in life, yeah, good friends. I'm particularly moved by his discussion about siblings uh, and, and that sibling rivalry was at the core of uh, religious yes. difference. Yes. Um, at the, and I think he, I think he actually personally expressed some, some, uh, notion of a conflict with his own sibling, but I mean that that's that's really not 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 here. Uh, do you think the sibling rivalry uh, as a as an as a quest, as a discussion about uh, religious conflict is a, is a good one? Um, well, personally, I think it's very. We, we sort of forget that um, no sooner had the the Adam and the Eve had children, and the two children are at one another's. Or there's rivalry between the two children, so that there's something at the, at the core of us that is amiss and uh, that leads us to uh, feel threatened by the, even those who are right beside us, those closest to us. And yet they're also the source of, of great love and companionship and, and much learning if we're open to it. Jeremy? So it's good to just repeat. Do you, do you think the, the notion of a sibling rivalry as a description of religious difference is a good one? I, uh, um, God gives it to us, you know, from, from the very beginning, a Cain and Abel, you know, all the way through, we, the, the sibling rivalry is there. Um, and it is not always about who is going to be on top it's it, it's you know in in Cain and Abel it's it, it's it's two people desiring to serve God best um and disappointment that somebody that they haven't succeeded in serving God best oh, what a what a wonderful you know it, it, what a wonderful way of understanding the tensions that we have in the world um you know we find the evil and identify the evil only after we have fallen apart trying to do good. Um, and so, you know, I think that explains the tensions in so many political organizations committed to the same ends ostensibly. And there was discussion about civil war earlier. And I was just flicking on the chat now. You know, th th there is this, th it is amongst our friends that we find often the greatest tensions. Um, and those stem often from trying to be the best we can. And as soon as we try to do that to the exclusion of the other or putting the other down, we, 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 take, us to, we take society down the, a very terrible road. So I think it's no accident that the sibling, sibling rivalry it, it, you know, is part of the opening story and a continuing theme throughout the scripture. Um, Friedrich Kaufmann wants to ask a question. Well, I would like to share with you that I felt a sense of kinship with Rabbi Sachs and it stemmed from when he wrote about things that he loved in the world in one of his covenant conversations. 
And the one that drew me was that he absolutely loved that first cup of coffee in the morning. And I was so related to that, that it really gave me um, a sense of closeness to him over the years. <laughs> thank you very much um, for that reflection. Um, I thank you very much, everybody, for your participation. I particularly want to thank our speakers, Rabbi Jeremy Lawrence, Reverend Colleen O'Reilly, and uh, Evan Thornley for a wonderful and stimulating discussion. Thank you very much. I, I wish we could hear the applause, but I'm sure people want to applaud you uh, silently or... Thank you very much, everybody, for attending and uh, look forward to seeing you again. Thank you, everyone.